so we have quorum is that right Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order then since it is 630 and then if the other two members join us late we'll just <laughs> welcome them in. So, um, good evening I'm um, Councillor Stephanie Finley and I am going to be kicking us off tonight um, for the rate review committee and it's going to be my job to sort of run things and tell you guys as a committee um, elect your chair and vice chair so welcome Zyra can you do a roll call for us please yeah Brenda Morris you have to unmute yourself and say here Okay, am I still muted? No, you're good. Perfect, thank you. Melanie, I do not want to butcher her last name. I don't see her though. Jennifer Bean? Here. Ned Knight? Here. Wesley Clark? Here. Sean Kelso? Ron Sinicki. Hmm. <clears throat> Alexander. Here. And Stephanie. Here. And it looks like we have Melanie as well. I'm here. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank, Thank you. you all so much for being here. So we're going to kick this off by electing a chair, a vice chair, and a secretary of this committee. So at this time, I will go ahead and take nominations. <laughs> don't be afraid to speak up. You can nominate yourself. Well, it's kind of hard when we don't know anybody else, so or what their background is. Do we have anyone that is a veteran of the um, rate review committee that might wanna step up and chair? I'm a veteran, but I don't want the extra responsibility. It's just me. <laughs> I like being a participant. Hmm. Okay. Would you be interested in being vice chair? Well, I guess you could twist my arm if there's someone else that could do chair. Okay. Can you tell us what um, the responsibilities of the chair would be? Sure. So your responsibility as chair of these um, committees are to run the meetings. So doing kind of what I'm doing right now, um, the staff will provide you with your um, agenda. And so really what you need to do is just work through the agenda, make sure that you're getting through all the information. Staff will really help you with it. Um, they're old veterans at this. And so they, they will help you through this. But basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna run the agenda, make sure that you're covering all the topics and then you'll be the person that entertains any motions and votes. Um, one of the things that, that is great is that staff will do a lot of the things like taking roll call. Um, they will often, they will be the ones that count the votes and those kinds of things to let you know whether or not it's passed and not passed. So really you're the person who is just sort of running the meeting and making sure that the agenda is flowing through. Is there an extra time constraint as far as if you're the, the chair? There really isn't. Um, you know, I think as a chair, you probably want to run through the agenda um, just to look at it. But I'm hoping that everybody does that anyway ahead of time to just see what the what is on the agenda and what you're going to be talking about. But really, the time commitment is here at the meetings, making sure that um, we're we're moving through the agenda. But no, there's not an additional meeting. There's not an additional time um, frame that you're going to be asked to do work outside of these meetings. Well, if nobody else is going to volunteer, I used to be 
I'll just introduce myself a little bit. Do I have I, anyone that will step up and chair? That, that would, I'm volunteering, but I would just like to tell you, give you a little bit of background to tell you why I would, might be qualified to do that. I, um, I'm a recently retired attorney. I'm from Hawaii. Um, I used to work for the attorney general's office and I used to represent the consumer advocate before the public utilities commission over there. So on a statewide basis, we were responsible for doing rate review for all of the public utilities there, um, which mo by and large were private, not public like they appear to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd have to take an in-depth look at what the rate base was, what the rate of return was, so on and so forth, to um, see whether or not, you know, we would approve their, their request for a rate increase or re request for an addition to the rate base or so on and so forth. So. Great, can I take that as a nomination for yourself? I'll, I'll do it. If anybody else wants to, I'd be happy to let them because as I said, okay. I just retired, so. <laughs> Thank you. And is there a second for that nomination? I'll second. Thank you, Melanie seconded that. Are there any other nominations for chair? I'm looking through and I am not seeing any other indication that there's another nomination. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna vote on that. So all those in favor of nominating, of um, accepting Brenda as the chair of this committee, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. And Zyra, that looks like that's unanimous. Thank you, Brenda, for stepping up. And if you are so inclined, I will finish with the nomination and then I will hand the chair over to you. Does that sound acceptable? Okay, except I don't know how prepared I am to run the meeting today, but. <laughs> That's okay. Luckily, you have some wonderful staff that do most of the talking. So um, this will be a this will be a good getting your feet wet meeting. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to the vice chair. Do I have nominations for that? I know that Ned said that he might uh, be interested yeah. in that. I don't know. Ned's not interested. <laughs> Okay, Jennifer nominates Ned, is there a second? Oh, I should probably introduce myself, huh? Um, sure. Anyway, I teach environmental science classes at Linfield down in McMinnville part-time. And I just retired from teaching biology up at Reed College for 35 years. So I'm part retired, still teaching, mostly online classes right now. And this will be my second cycle of doing this. So, yeah. Oh, welcome. Thank you. You too. And I did I have a great? Thank you. I have a second oh. by Wesley. Are there any other nominations on the floor? Seeing no other indications, we will go ahead and vote. All those in favor for Ned for vice chair, please say aye or raise your hand. <laughs> Any opposed, same sign. And I count that as unanimous as well, Zyra. Thank you. And then the last position we have is that of secretary. Is there anyone willing to be secretary? What does that involve? Zyra, do you want to give them a lowdown? Because usually the committees I've sat on, we haven't had a secretary. Yeah, so, so basically right now, nothing that we're aware of. Um, I think it's just a part of the code. So we nominate just someone as secretary because it's, um, it's in the code. 
Yes, and Zyra or whatever staff member is um, the host of these meetings is usually the one that takes the notes and publishes the notes. So um, even though usually a secretary does that, that will be done by staff. Yeah, so maybe like when the committee was first initiated, that's why the secretary was um, voted in, but that's not the case anymore. Do I have any nominations for secretary? I'll nominate myself. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Jennifer. Do I have a second? I second. second. <laughs> thank you. Any Who other nominations? Second, Melanie? I'm sorry, what's that? Did you second it? I did. Okay. But I think Ned and I did at the same time, so. Yeah. A second Either and a or. third. <laughs> <laughs> Any other nominations? <laughs> Seeing no other indications of nominations, we'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor for Jennifer for secretary, please raise your hand or say aye. Thank you. All those opposed, same sign. And it looks like that's unanimous as well, Zyra. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, usually, I think um, Mayor Rick Rogers will be attending this meeting, so you will usually see his face. Um, I'm in his stead because he's on vacation this week, um, but one of us will be here. So um, it will most likely be um, Mr. Mayor um, Rick Rogers, but I will stand in um, if he's not available. So if you get stuck or need help with um, procedure, there will always be um, one of us here. And again, city staff will help you with everything. So I am gonna hand over the chair to Brenda. And it looks like we have a very pared down agenda tonight. Um, your 3B is an overview of utility rates for 2021. And you guys should have gotten a PowerPoint presentation um, in your agenda. And um, really Brenda, at this point, usually what you will do is you will hand it over to the staff and they will make their report to your committee. Okay, consider that done. <laughs> <laughs> Did you okay. want me to launch in, uh, staff, Katie? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Deb Gallardi, Gallardi Rothstein Group, and I'm the rate consultant to assist the committee and the city in um, conducting this every two year uh, utility rate review. And I am going to share my screen. Oh, it looks like uh, Give me one host needs to. Yeah, thanks. Just uh, so it's exciting to see um, a couple people back and uh, from a couple of years ago, it's exciting to see the, someone with um, uh, regulatory uh, rate case experience, Brenda, that's oh, great. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, we won't, no quizzes. <laughs> and um, really exciting to see so many new faces who um, want to learn about the process and engage uh, and advise the city on this. So- um, Are you allowed to now, Deb? Let me give it a try again. Yes, uh, let me get to the right file. I'm gonna share that. We're gonna go into presentation mode. Oops, except I need to go to the beginning. Here we go. All right, so the purpose of my presentation is overview to try to give you a high level review of the entire process. And then we are going to go through it uh, for each utility system. So don't feel like, oh gosh, I've got to, you know, take notes and and this is my only shot at understanding how this goes because we're gonna do it four times <laughs> for four different systems. So um, 
this is just to give you a flavor for um, the steps, the technical analysis, and um, some of the industry practices and uh, some of the background specific to Newberg. So we'll start with that. And I can't see the chat and I can't see everybody's faces. So I'm good with people asking questions as we go along. And I think somebody else is going to monitor if there's a hand up and somebody has a question. So please, um, who's ever doing that, I think it's Katie maybe, yeah. um, let me know, uh, just uh, you know, uh, interject that somebody has a question and I'll pause and, and we can discuss that. So uh, I think we have plenty of time allocated this evening. So any questions, uh, please don't be shy. There are no you know, dumb questions. So we're all just about learning here tonight. So I wanna start really basic uh, that just introduce you to what it means to be a utility enterprise. We've got four utility systems that we are going to be reviewing the water system, the sewer system, which is also referred to as wastewater. That's the, the dirty water, um, storm water, and uh, street maintenance. And these are utility enterprises. And as such, they rely specifically on funding from fees and charges. So these are not, these activities are not supported by general taxation, like general fund um, services and, uh, you know, police and parks and other things like that. These are funded specifically by utility rates. You can see in the pie chart that this is based on a snapshot from last year for one of the systems. 90% of the revenue comes from the utility rates that are charged to customers. Uh, there's some other fees and charges for specific services, like if uh, somebody comes in, a developer comes in to pull a permit for a new construction, there are specific fees related to that permit. That development would also pay systems development charges, which represent about 6% of the revenue um, in this snapshot pie chart and systems development charges go to fund capital improvement costs specifically related to new development. And then there's just some miscellaneous income, interest income on unspent uh, funds that carry over um, as part of uh, the utility operations. But as you can see, the majority of the cost comes from the rates so it's very important that the city review the rates regularly and to make sure that there are sufficient funds to cover the annual expenditures. Uh, and it's been the practice policy of the city to uh, do those rate increases every two years. The recommendations that come out of this process establish the rates for, a two, for two years. Um, and uh, then we go at it again. And I've had the privilege of working with the city on a number of these updates. The rate review process, I've broken it down into these uh, three kind of steps here. The first is to, and this is, I'm gonna talk about it collectively for all the systems, but we do this on an individual enterprise or utility basis. So the first step is to identify the financial needs and Karen's going to give you a, um, an update or a, an overview of each of the systems and uh, talk a little bit about uh, those, those systems and, and some of the, um, when we talk about capital, we're talking about the infrastructure and the cost to improve the infrastructure or add new components or replace things. Um, then there's costs associated with operating and maintaining that infrastructure and providing uh, other services. And then there are reserves. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this like you do in your own home or business budgeting, have kind of a rainy day fund should your expenses, there be emergency expenses or 
the revenue doesn't come in as projected because we have a wet year and water sales are down or something like that. Um, or there's a pandemic and uh, there are, you know, business closures or uh, schools closures. So reserves are really important and that'll be um, something that we talk a fair amount about uh, because it does have a, an impact on um, the needed rate increases um, that we'll be looking at. Then we evaluate the, the revenue sources. As I've mentioned, primary revenue is from rates. So that's the, our primary focus. And we, but we do project out what other uh, fees and charges and available uh, reserves are. And then um, we project the revenue under existing rates and um, look, then uh, to determine what are the overall revenue increases that might be needed. Like maybe it's just a cost of living kind of increase. Um, but then we also consider should those increases be applied across the board to all the different rate components. And I'll talk about what the rate components are um, and to all the customer classes, or should we be increasing some components more than others? So um, that's a consideration that the uh, rate review committee also participates in. So it's a, it's a fairly involved process as Ned knows. Um, it's, there's a lot of technical information, a lot of numbers, and uh, we'll make that as um, understandable for you as we can. This is a sample municipal services statement, and you'll see that uh, the primary dollars uh, for this sample customer, uh, the bills really, um, the water and the wastewater bills are the uh, the, the main components or the, the highest components, then the storm, storm water and the transportation utility fee. There are these two other fees, the public safety fee and the communication officer fee that were established uh, through an ordinance uh, resolution uh, some years ago. And they have separate um, uh, with provisions about how those increase. So those aren't, things that we tend to look at as part of the rate review process. But just know that there are other things on the bill that um, when uh, you pay your utility services statement, in addition to the, to the four that we'll be looking at, there are a couple of other items. Deb, I got a question if you have a moment. Yeah, you bet. On the first two items, water and wastewater, our bills are still not showing these uh, breakdowns. And I, I asked if that could be done two years ago. And even still, it just says water and what the total is and sewer and what the total is. And I think customers would really, at least a lot of them should enjoy and appreciate seeing that there's a base charge and then, you know, the volume beyond that. So maybe this is more directed towards the, the uh, staff, but can this be expanded out for all residents' statements that they get every month? You know, um, I guess I can speak to that. Um, we've been looking at maybe changing our the way we do with the utility billing just to make them more concise and kind of have more information on it. So that's really good feedback, but that's something citizens would like to see. Yeah. So that's something that we can, I can for sure look at seeing if we can add to the bills and working with our utility billing people to see what we can do to make the statements better and more readable. Yeah, because I think that, it, for example, wastewater, you know, over half of it is a service charge. Okay, a flat fee, and then the volume beyond that. So there's a big chunk that's just basic when people are looking, for example, to reduce their bill overall, well, the service charge is gonna be the same, but you know, how much can reduction in volume make a difference? So I think if, if somehow this could be expanded and on the bill, there's enough physical space in the box, white space that a couple of extra lines would fit. Yeah, Ned, thank you, that's great feedback. Hey, Ned, are you, are you talking about the, like the, the physical paper bill? Yes. Okay, because I'm looking at my online bill. I just pulled it up because I was curious because I had not uh -huh. really paid attention. And it is broken out for me. 
on my on, yeah on the online bill i mean it's it, by line it's um you know there's sewer there's stormwater everything is broken out okay well that's good to know so at least it's halfway there halfway there <laughs> like if they could just convert what is being given to us online yeah to you know, on paper those, like, yeah for those that get paper right okay good to know <laughs> Deb, while well, we're still um, talking about, uh, you know, Great Base and all that kind of stuff, will we be getting information on what the composition of your rate base is for these various services? So, yeah, um, when, and and I'll get into, let's see, when we get time. Um, uh, I don't have a slide on this, but um, since you come, uh, to this from a regulatory background and you're used to seeing um, uh, the, the rate, what, what you're referring to as rate, rate base, um, that is reflective of determination of the utility revenue requirements um, on a, what we call a utility basis. So there's a operation and maintenance costs and, and a return on, on rate base and depreciation that make up the capital component. When we do this process, uh, most municipal uh, rate setting is done on a cash basis. And so we utilize the, the budget. And instead of the rate base that you're used to seeing, we look at debt service and cash funded capital. So you absolutely will be um, seeing those components um, uh, that are important parts of the revenue requirements for each system. It, the terminology is just a little different when we, when we look at the municipal um, uh, revenue requirements. But we'll sure. get more into that as we go through. And we do, you'll be getting a lot of, uh, of information specific to each system about uh, what those costs and requirements from rates are. Great, thanks. Yep. Okay, any other questions on the utility or municipal services statement? Okay, let's move on here then. Oops. Okay, so we'll start talking about the rate development process. So uh, key to this process is the development of the financial plan. And if you do financial planning for your home or your business, it's a, probably a similar kind of process, though we do have different terminology and different types of costs uh, and revenue sources. It's, um, you know, as part of this process, I develop a um, Excel-based spreadsheet that forecasts out, does looks at the cash flow because um, it's on a cash basis of uh, projections over a 10 year period. And um, we start with uh, looking at those sources of funds, which are the user rates, the, the SDCs or systems development charges, other income. And then we uh, project the expenses. Operating expenses include the personnel costs electricity to run pumps and other equipment, chemicals in the treatment process, other different types of commodities that are necessary, uh, contract services like my time to assist you, uh, other planning costs associated with uh, development of the master plans that identify the capital improvements that are needed to, uh, for the systems to comply with uh, regulatory requirements and other things. Um, and then uh, we look at the capital financing, obviously being a very important part of this process. Unfortunately, utility systems have been underfunded historically in that we have, because um, elected officials, understandably, uh, don't like raising rates, um, you know, we've tended to focus on the immediate needs and not on what it requires is required for repair and replacement and to keep up with that um, over to, you know on an annual basis. So the capital improvements are an important part of it and some in some 
uh, cases for very large improvements, debt may be issued, bonds are sold or loans are taken out from state funding um, funders and then paid off over generally a 20 year period. And other kind of replacement type items tend to be funded directly out of cash that is coming in from fees and charges or from existing fund balances. And then uh, again, the understanding uh, what type of reserves, reserves are so key because it does help us to stabilize rates. So um, uh, when you see the capital improvements that um, have been identified for each system in this planning period, Oftentimes they're kind of lumpy, the investments that are needed because you can't build half of a reservoir. You have to build the whole thing and that's expensive. And so one year, you know, you might have a major improvement that's needed and uh, you've got to fund that. And then the next year, maybe it's kind of more routine uh, re repair replacement type infrastructure. And to try to smooth out those peaks um, we can apply reserves that we have in the bank to um, smooth out the, the, the revenue requirements. And so it's a good thing to have reserves for all kinds of reasons, and they uh, are an important part of our discussion. So we project out the costs. We project out what funds we have available, what we anticipate having available for current rates, and then we see where's the gap. Uh, and do we need to raise rates uh, to meet um, all our projected expenses? Generally, the answer is yes, we need to raise rates. Um, you think about it uh, that all of the costs that the city um, incurs in providing these services, they're increasing to general inflation, you know, staffing costs, insurance costs, uh, all of these, uh, both the operating and the capital costs are increasing. And so um, rate increases, some cities will have just a, a, a policy that uh, allows the rates to be increased every year with the consumer price index, for example, uh, just to keep pace with inflation. But then there's that capital component of you know, what is really needed to fund our specific capital improvements. So we are, um, uh, I would say the, in recent years, uh, <coughs> excuse me, rate increases have been about double the rate of inflation uh, if we look nationally. Was there a question? Actually, I have a simple one. Could you give an sure. example in that last column of a franchise fee? What, what type that is? So the franchise fee is uh, charged by the city uh, general fund on all utilities. And that is both private utilities as well as the city run facilities. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a percent of revenue. And um, oftentimes it's for doing, you know, improvements in the, the right of way, um, I don't, uh, um, maybe somebody from the city can speak to the specifics about how the franchise fee revenue, it, it basically goes back to the general fund, Okay. but it is something that's paid by both public and private utilities. Got it. Thanks. Sure. So when we look at, you know, okay, how do we look in our crystal ball and figure out what those uh, expenses are going to be? Well, we look to a couple different things. We start with the budget. So the budget process, um, so in the current year for the city budget process, we are in what we call fiscal year 21-22. Um, it starts July 1st of each year and ends June 30th of the following year. So we are in the 21-22 fiscal year. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, then we consider economic factors. You might have heard about inflation recently. It's been quite in the news that uh, the general inflation level has been higher. Um, so we, we consider 
what's happening in the economy. There are um, supply chain shortages and all sorts of scary sounding things that do have an impact on the costs. And so we try to um, consider all of that and look at our assumptions and project out in a way that balances risk. We want to not, we want to be somewhat conservative in that uh, if we under um, estimate what the costs are going to be, you're going to come up short in revenue. If we overestimate, uh, then, you know, you've maybe you've raised rates more than you otherwise would need to. So we try to balance all of that. For the capital improvements, the master plans are what really drive the priorities and Karen will uh, and her staff uh, will, will walk us through those as we go through each system. Um, repair and replacement needs, regulatory requirements, growth, all of those things. For the, on the revenue side, um, we look at things like customer trends and customer growth, uh, consumption, water consumption, uh, both water and wastewater rates are charged based on water use. And so that's a key factor in projecting utility revenue. Uh, financial policies play into it. You know, there are requirements, for example, if you issue debt on how much uh, your rates need to uh, recover every year to uh, provide some stability and, and insurance that those uh, rates can repay the debt service. And uh, with SDCs, we consider what new development is in the pipeline and uh, the number of, of new units that will be uh, potentially charged. So lots of things go into uh, the forecast and I work closely with staff to make sure I have all of the local considerations. And then of course I do this work all over the country and in the Northwest. And so I can bring the considerations from the industry. Um, <clears throat> in terms of considering, you know, how are things looking uh, in terms of the rates? This is a, kind of an example from last time. Usually there are factors that are working in the utilities favor to hold down rates. Things like customer growth. If you think about as we add customers to the system, utility uh, systems are, and costs are generally fixed that as you add more customers, the costs don't increase proportionately because you can serve, you know, with each, you know, additional customer, it's not like, okay, I need to go out and, you know, build something new or my, um, you know, maybe I'll see a, a, an uptick in my, some of my chemicals, my variable costs like chemicals or power as water usage changes. But a lot of the costs are fixed in the short term. Obviously over the longer term, as we add more customers, we have to build the facilities bigger. But additional customers in the short term spread the cost over a larger base um, and tend to have downward pressure on rate increases. Obviously, uh, reducing borrowing costs when uh, there's debt. So the city has done a great job in both securing favorable lending terms from state agencies and also refinancing to when the, there's an opportunity to do so to reissue debt at a lower cost. So that's been really important and kept the, the rates lower than they otherwise would have to be. And also, um, leveraging existing reserves, as I said, to the extent that you have money in the bank that you can apply to a, a large in, a, you know, capital improvement, you don't have to issue debt, you don't have to incur interest costs, and that helps. Pardon me, one second. Um, <clears throat> on the flip side, upward pressure comes from significant capital investment that's needed and uh, when there is a need to borrow. And if you skip rate increases, <laughs> that, uh, 
then you've got catch up to do. And that's certainly been the case at a number of times in the city's history, as well as every other client I work with. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> Can I ask one question before you move on? Yeah. You know, with, I've noticed there's a lot of new, um, especially residential developments that are coming up in Newburgh. And um, do you folks take into account the First, well, first of all, do you get developers fees that would cover the impact on the existing infrastructure? Yes, those are the systems systems development charges. Absolutely. Okay. All right. And do you are they also charged a fee, or is there some means of recovery for the impact on the existing? Um, you know, well, I'm sorry. Is there some um, data that's uh, that would take um, that would tell you about the impact on the projected capital improvements for the our system? It, it, sure. And, and the, the city went and works with um, engineering consultants as well to help uh, determine, you know, what, it, what the uh, projected additional demands on the system will be evaluate the capacity that's available and then to identify where there's bottlenecks and where improvements need to be made. Great, so we'll get that information too then. Um, to the extent that it's, uh, you know, I we're gonna focus on the priorities of the capital improvements that are needed in our planning period and, and Karin and the other staff who present that information, usually we'll talk about what's driving the need for those improvements, whether it's something that's needed because of growth or whether it's something that's needed because of regulatory requirements. So yeah, you'll, you'll get some information on that. Great, thanks, sorry. No, no worries. Uh, so the just, you know, financial resiliency has become a key um, consideration for the utility industry um, generally, and certainly has been part of our prior rate uh, review discussions. And I tend to look at that th three primary components. You're gonna hear me talk more and more about reserves and the importance of having money in the bank um, to uh, apply to, in, to use as contingencies and to help smooth capital improvements. Um, as Ned pointed out, I think, as we were looking at the utility services statement, that um, the uh, fixed charges, which are those um, just flat monthly user fees, not related to consumption, those are can be a uh, significant portion of the bill. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned previously, that most of the uh, really 85% or so when we look generally at, at utilities are of 85% of, of the costs are fixed, meaning that if water usage were to decline, the costs are what they are and we're not gonna see a, a similar decline in, in the cost. So we really, to maintain a stable, predictable funding stream we need to um, target 30 to 40 percent, and many utilities are higher. I mean, many utilities I work with recover over 50 percent of their revenue from fixed charges that aren't uh, tied to water consumption, and that's um, because of the fact that that so much of the cost is is fixed, and um, but. There's the flip side of that is we do like to give people control over their bills, send a price signal that if you use less, you'll pay less. So it's a balance, but the industry standard is at least 30% of the revenue recovered annually from all customers that that be in the form of fixed charges. And um, the new standard has increased to um, uh, and practice has increased to 40%. So that, that's been a, a, an important part of the citizen rate review recommendations in prior years that when we started, 
oh, I'd say 10 or 15 years ago. And this was a, an issue with the industry um, generally that concert, all you heard about was conservation, conservation, and oh, we need to send a strong message through our rate structure for people to use less water. Um, and guess what? They did. They, they started using less water and those utilities that had most of their revenue coming in from these variable charges all of a sudden didn't have enough revenue to cover their costs. So the pendulum swung in the other direction right around you know 2008, you know, the, the Great Recession. And people started under, you know, looking at resiliency as, as a primary objective um, to, in order to provide reliable, um, stable service. So we'll talk a, a lot more about, and this is just to say that part of your role and part of why we go through this process is not just to say, okay, utility rates need to increase 3% or 4% or whatever it is, but are we maintaining a rate structure that is balances the various objectives um, that are important um, for uh, for other things related to affordability, resiliency, all of the the other objectives that come into the into play, um, and then moderate annual adjustments to minimize rate spikes. It's always tempting to say, let's not have a rate increase this year that's probably going to mean that down the road, you're gonna have a larger rate increase than you otherwise would if you had gone ahead and at least increased for inflation in any given year. Cash reserves, um, the, so you can see that in this uh, shot here of this uh, American Water Works Association, which is uh, the industry um, uh, group that actually has a utility rate making manual, they put out a policy, policy guidelines in 2018 because of the importance of, of including cash reserves as part of a rate making uh, utility management process. And you can, there's all different types of reserves, operating reserves, capital reserves, debt service. They're all about, um, you know, as I said, being prepared for unexpected um, changes in costs or revenues, planning for future improvements, um, just uh, you know helps to smooth things, uh, rate increases, and also to make sure that you can cover your costs. And in the end, it it keeps it the the service more affordable because if you have reserves, you don't have to debt fund as much. So uh, just to give you, uh, those of you who haven't been through the process before, um, the, the last rate review committee was looking at rate increases for um, fiscal year 2021 and the current year 2022. The rate increases go into effect January 1st. And that's um, in part because um, there was the decision made, was made some years ago that it it was best not to uh, have the, any rate increases happen at the same time where you're having peak water use because all of a sudden people are using more water and then you're increasing their rates and their bills um, are significantly higher. So the rate uh, adjustment was shifted to the winter months when consumption isn't as high. So it can be, those increases can be absorbed uh, without quite the shock that uh, otherwise uh, would happen if it were in the summer. There are, within the water utility, there are two types of services that are considered. There's the potable water service, that's the water that comes out of your tap, goes you know, also for the majority of the irrigation that you use as well. But there's also uh, non-potable uses that uh, are uh, oftentimes referred to as purple pipe because it, um, this is a lower, uh, different quality of water not for drinking purposes, but it's high quality water for irrigation purposes and is used um, by, it can be used by some customers um, for, for irrigation purposes. And so there's, but because it's, it's a different product, um, it has a different cost associated with producing it. 
And so there's a separate uh, rate consideration. This, the, you could see that while the potable water rates went up 4% each year, the non-potable went up 10% and then 2%. That 10% reflected the fact that it, that system's rates had not changed for um, some years. And so we did an in-depth review uh, of what the, the current costs, the, the then current costs were. And that 10% was uh, what was recommended to bring it up to its actual cost of service. Um, there's only a few customers that right now can utilize non-potable water. Um, then for wastewater and stormwater, you can see those, those increases. And you'll notice that in generally speaking, well, in all cases, other than the, no, the non-potable, that they, the rate increases are the same in both years. And that's part of that smoothing uh, objective that uh, the city and the practice that the city has, has had. Um, the stormwater, you know, it's important, per, one, just a note of caution when looking at percentages. You go, oh, well, stormwater rates went up 9%. Well, stormwater is one of, is uh, second to transportation, the one of the smaller of the bills. So a 9% increase in the stormwater rate is a smaller dollar increment than a 9% would be for water or wastewater. So those were the rate increases that were applied when you consider just the overall revenue. As I mentioned, part of what we look at is also should the, there be different changes in either potable versus non-potable water rates, fixed versus variable components of the rates. Um, and when we get into some of the rates actually vary by customer type. So a residential customer pays a different rate than a commercial customer. And all of that analysis considers um, what are the service requirements of the different cl customer classes. And we follow uh, standard rate making principles and methods established by the American Water Works Association uh, to evaluate that. Um, and uh, this- Oh, Deb, I had a question oh, yeah. on that previous sure. slide. Just a yeah. quick one. What do you mean by sure. trip generation in intensity of use? Ah, okay, yeah. So I've talked a lot about the water uh, systems, but there's that uh, street maintenance uh, utility fee. Okay. And that fee varies by type of customer um, based on the estimated trip trips generated by that customer. So a fast food restaurant is going to be in a different category of use than an office building. Okay. Because yeah. per, uh, usually those are assessed on a, a basis of, of uh, the size of the, the building, the structure. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the intensity of use of a thousand square feet whether it's a fast food restaurant or an office is significantly different. And so they're gonna pay different rates. Right. Okay, thanks, um, Scott. Yeah, so this is, and, and again, you know, just, this is just snapshot, just kind of try to take it in and we'll, we're gonna come back and drill down in this in a lot more detail. Uh, but this is the, the, gives you a snapshot of the current water rates and um, you can, a couple things to, to note here. There are three different components, a service charge, a meter charge. Both of these components are fixed, which means they don't vary for a given customer from month to month. Um, once it's established, that's what you're charged every month of the year. It does vary uh, between customers based on the meter size because it costs more to, um, repair, replace a larger meter. And it also reflects the fact that larger water meters are customers who uh, require more capacity. And so a portion of the debt service costs are recovered through the meter charges in, a, in an effort to balance uh, and to recover that uh, roughly uh, 
30% of, of the annual revenue from the fixed charges. Um, you'll also notice that the volume charge, that's the portion that's variable based on the usage of the individual customer and it changes each month. The rate doesn't change, but the customer bill changes uh, based on uh, the usage. So that's charged on a CCF basis, which is, stands for 100 cubic feet. That's how the water meter measures and that's how you're charged. You'll see Can that I ask those- a question about one of the categories? Sure. Um, I obviously didn't remember this from two years ago, but I noticed one is outside city. So yes. is there much water service going to uh, customers outside city limits? There's not much. Um, I don't know if anybody on city staff can can say off, you know, off the top, uh, how roughly how many customers are outside city. I don't know that off off the top of my head. Yeah, we don't <clears throat> we don't have very many individual customers, but we do um, serve other um, water um, districts that are outside the city limits. So. The, the numbers, we would have to dig them out for you, but we don't serve very many. Okay. I just thought it was unusual that outside city typically can mean like a longer distance and that, well, we can talk about this later on, we get into numbers, but it seems like maybe there, that one should be higher than in the middle. I don't know. Anyway, just a thought. Yeah, we can, we can talk more we'll about that yeah. yeah but but you are correct in that you're saying you, you know what you're talking about are service level differences differences mm -hmm. in service requirements right. um and what these rates and the differential in, in the rates if everybody used water the same kind of um throughout the year then Generally, what you would have are rates that were pretty similar across mm -hmm. the different customer classes. But customers uh, use water, for example, for irrigation purposes, which means these are customers who during the peak, um, uh, when the, you know, really require the system to produce water um, to meet that peak day demand, uh, that is... Uh, a factor in how large the facilities are built because we have to build things. It, the city has to be able to provide the water that's demanded on any given day at any given hour. And so systems are sized for that peak demand. And the peak demand for an irrigation customer is very different than for a uh, you know, multifamily residential customer sure. where, you know, they don't have uh, uh, as much seasonal variation. So these rate differences, the cost per unit of water sold is much higher for those customers that have a, um, a higher peak uh, demand. And then of course the non-potable, as I said, that's a lower quality product. So the uh, rate is is a bit lower uh, for non-potable, and then the outside city is is actually based on a policy of uh, like a fifty percent differential. Um, so there are some, and that's not unusual that um, to have uh, customers that are located outside of the city um, uh, subject to a surcharge um, in. Uh, uh, you know, in, in regulated uh, utilities, that's, you know, equivalent to a higher rate of return uh, mm -hmm. that the city as owners of the system are um, allowed to recover from uh, non-owners of customers. So that's the water rates. Yeah, was there Let a question? Let me jump in um, to provide a little bit more information on that also for the outside city, just so we all know that the city does have regulations in place that doesn't allow for additional development to occur outside the city and get that water. Um, the only time anybody can get um, water that's outside the city limits is under what's called a hardship. And that means that it's an existing home, say, and their well has 
run dry mm. and there's really no other options for them okay. at that stage in the game. So um, at least right now, the way the city code is written is that we wouldn't be adding additional outside city customers. Okay. So just something to keep in mind. Yep. Good to know. Although, although that might change with the non quotable one thing that the council has asked us to do is put together regulations that might allow for um, specifically agricultural uses outside the city to be able to use the non potable system. So that may be something that we want to talk about as we go through and get to that point, but that would be the only caveat to that. Okay. Good. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Karin, for those additions. Moving on to sewer or wastewater rates. Uh, you can see here, as um, Ned pointed out when we were looking at that utility services statement, a much higher, uh, higher service charge or fixed charge, generally higher rates compared to water. Um, and you have a similar situation where the rate does vary by the type of customer in some cases. So there's there are fewer customer classes with rate differential. And for, for sewer, what we're concerned about is the concentration of the wastewater. So the dirtier the water discharge from the customer, the higher the cost to treat. And so this commercial one, two, three, you can see um, the the customers with the highest concentration of wastewater tend to be restaurants of retail. Um, there are some industrial customers uh, that, that would, but not, not industrial customers in Newburgh. Um, mini markets, car washes, mortuaries, you know, are kind of in that medium category. And then general retail office, things like that are basically have, um, wastewater strength that's similar to a residential customer. So those rate differentials uh, reflect the, the added um, costs associated with treating um, higher strength waste. Excuse me, Deb, do we yeah. have a primary sewage treatment system here or a secondary one? Um, I'm gonna let Karen talk about that when she okay. <laughs> gets into okay. her presentation is next. No problem. Okay. Sorry, uh, I'll just uh, I'll just say for the record that I'm an economist. I am not an engineer. <laughs> and while I can talk about some of this stuff, uh, when it gets too technical like that, I'll uh, I'll let uh, the city staff handle that. So just to finish up here, so Karen can get to her presentation. Um, those were the, uh, you know, we'll talk about transportation and stormwater rates, uh, the rate structures. They're, they're much simpler uh, when we get into those systems. But first up for the deep dive into uh, the rate review will be the wastewater system. And right now we're working on the forecasting of the uh, costs, the financial needs, projecting the revenue under existing rates, figuring out uh, Karin and I usually go back and forth with sort of uh, looking at the sequencing of the capital improvements and trying to match that as best we can to the available revenue, but also understanding the regulatory and, you know, replacement needs. Um, and then we'll review our preliminary findings at the next meeting uh, on October 27th. So that is your utility rate overview and Karin is going to provide your systems overview but if there's any other questions for me right now happy to take those yeah. all right i'm going to stop sharing my screen all right thanks everybody for your attention and look forward to working with you thank you Thank you very much. That was interesting. All right. Uh, so I'm Karen Hoffman, the city engineer. For those of you who I have not met before, Zyra, did you get the PowerPoint? Is, so yes. Zyra is going to run the um, PowerPoint for me, and I'm going to give you just an overview of the four different systems that you're going to look at um, over the next several months. Um, and so, uh, there you go. Next slide, please. I'm running on Citrix, so it might be a little slow.
Not even moving. Give me a second. Okay. There we go. So the first one up is the wastewater um, system. And there's really um, two main components that go along with the wastewater system. There's the collection system, and we have both gravity and several lift stations within the city. And then uh, we do have the, the treatment plant. We do do our own treatment before it's discharged into the Willamette River. Next slide, please. So here's kind of a um, capital improvement map that was put together as part of the wastewater master plan. And so the blue lines are all lines that are um, good. And this is just giving you an update. I'll, I will make sure that you guys have um, links to get to our master plans and our capital improvement pro program plans so that you guys have all that background information. And then the red and the yellow dots are locations where there are, are um, concerns with um, whether there's a possible overflow in the future, um, an existing constriction or those types of things going on. What do all the blue dots represent? That it's just fine. The blue Karen? dots are, yes. Uh, I just guess what the blue dots represent. That means that the system is just fine in that location. Oh, okay, got it. Next slide, please. So here kind of answers um, Brenda's question a little bit about this is the, the system at our treatment plant. Um, so it comes into our treatment plant, goes through our headwater, our headworks building, um, and, and then it goes into what we call oxidation ditches. Uh, we do have an equalization basin also if the flow gets to be too much. Um, and uh, But the oxidation ditches um, run, basically they oxidate, J Ox I can't say that word, oxidate. Yeah, they, they put bubbles in <laughs> the water basically, <laughs> make the bacteria work. Um, and then it goes into uh, clarifier distribution boxes secondary clarifiers um, and chlorine, um, then dechlorination before it's um, released to the river. The solids on the other hand, go into um, a sludge storage container. We do a uh, dewatering system and then we create compost out of it. Um, a lot of systems will take that, um, the solids and spread them on farmers fields or those types of things. We actually create a compost, a grade A compost, and we sell it out at our treatment plant. If you need any compost, feel free to um, go out there and get some. And then we sell that um, and then it gets used wherever it's necessary. So, so that kind Karen, of- Karen, a quick question on towards the bottom, what does RAS and WAS stand for? Um, that's. It, I have to remember what the the terms mean. Um, I mean, I understand the process fine. I'm yeah. just curious what they meant. Let me let me look into that, and I'll get back to you. Oh, I, I bet it ends in activated sludge, but I don't yeah, know what it the R sludge, but I can't remember, and that's why I want to verify. I okay. know what it means, but the actual what the actual r means i mm -hmm. i need okay. to look so by the way my neighbor uses that compost every year he gets huge zucchini and even larger pumpkins it works really well so it does yep okay so any other questions on the about the wastewater system okay next slide please Thank you, Russ just returned activated sludge, what the R stands for, Russ okay. just came. Thank you. So main issues within our um, wastewater system are what we call inflow infiltration. You, you get this a lot in, um, in older systems, 
where we have a lot of trees and those types of things, uh, you have basically stormwater or groundwater that infiltrates into the pipes. And then what it means is that you're treating that additional water in our treatment plant, which is not necessary. So we've been actively working on trying to reduce the amount of what we call inflow and infiltration into the system. Um, maintenance, again, we have, um, we have an older system. So we have a lot of pipes that need to be um, maintained. The pipes generally last uh, 45 to 70 years, depending on the type of pipe. And we have pipes in the ground that are of that age. Um, and then we have several lift stations um, in town, particularly on the west edge of town. And so we're working on, we've got a couple projects, you'll see those later on, that um, look to putting in some larger stations and taking some of the smaller ones offline, um, which reduces the maintenance costs um, long term. I have a question about the pipes. Mm -hmm. So the pipes in the ground, um, would you say they're mostly like in the city limits? Or are they mostly like clay pipe or are they cast iron pipe, the older pipe? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, because I worked for a plumbing company before, mm -hmm. and I know that the pipes will degrade at different rates. So it, it, that would really depend on when they need to be replaced or not. Agreed. Just pipe a pipe. Yeah. So I, was just, have, I was just curious. Yep. Yeah. No, we do. We do have. We have clay pipe in the ground. We actually have some manholes that are built out of brick. Um, okay. <laughs> and uh, we do have cast iron. We have. We have a variety of, of types of pipe. And yeah, it does make a difference. It also makes a difference on what it was, how it was constructed. If it was um, just placed on, um, you know, regular dirt, it makes a difference on how well that pipe has held up also. Sure, when we replace pipe now, what are we actually putting in the ground? Is it, is it like uh, a plastic pipe or? Uh, it depends on the size of pipe. Okay. Um, and we can talk about that, but generally, um, for when we water, water, we're trying to put in ductile iron, um, and then, um, wastewater, it depends on the size. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So our water system, um, our water system has, um, several different components to it, there's source, um, treatment, our distribution system, and then storage. Our, um, our source of our water is right now is a well, um, series of wells on the south side of the Willamette River in Marion County. And we pipe that um, over to our treatment plant. Excuse me. On the north side of the river, we have two pipes that bring that water over. Um, and it's treated and then sent out into our distribution system. And then we have three um, storage reservoirs throughout the city uh, that, that store the water for during peak times and also to provide for mostly for fire flow. Next slide, please. So this kind of gives you an idea again where those um, main pieces are within the city. Next slide, please. Just some pretty pictures. Um, the, what you'll see is the well field. Um, then that, that bridge that you see there used to be um, the Highway 219 bridge. It is no longer that. It is strictly a bridge that holds our one of our water lines. The other water line is actually under the river um, to the east of that, that bridge. And then the other picture that you see there is a picture of the water treatment facility. Next slide, please. So some of the issues that um, we're working through right now in the water system is uh, redundant source. Right now, uh, as I noted, we have, we have the well fields on the other side of the river and that is our only source of water. If something was to occur to that um, well field, uh, we would be without water to provide to the to the residents here in the city. Uh, we don't have a connection to another system or any of those types of things. 
So we have been actively working on um, do, finding another source. And uh, we're in a phase two of that. And we, we'll talk about that when we get to the water system. Um, seismic resiliency is another uh, big deal. There was um, state requirements that we look at what our level of service requirements need to be in case of a Cascadia sub subduction zone earthquake. We set some of those requirements. And so we have quite a few pipes. We need pipes and other things that we need to fix in order to provide water after a Cascadia event and or get the system back up and running um, in a timely manner after that type of an event. House Bill 20, 2001. So that was a requirement that has been set by the state that requires all cities within Oregon to provide for what they call middle housing. Um, so that's um, accessory dwelling units, that's duplexes, townhomes, triplexes, cluster of housing. And so there are requirements about when those um, types of housing has to be made available into our residential zones. The one piece that um, we had to look at was what whether our, the, our existing infrastructure would support those higher densities, especially in the residential zones. And what we found was, especially within our old town area, that we needed to upgrade the water pipes because they're not big enough to provide for the fire flow for those increased densities. Um, and so the state did grant us an extension to um, give us more time to replace those water pipes. We have nine years to replace those water pipes and get them um, in place. So that's that house bill 2001 and you'll see a bunch of projects again when we get to the water system that'll uh, show that. And then maintenance. Again, our system is older. So we have pipes that are um, that need to be replaced just on a regular um, maintenance schedule. Next slide, please. Actually, before I go to the stormwater, any other questions on the water system? Okay, stormwater. So stormwater is um, collection, treatment, and discharge. So um, treatment is generally done um, on a smaller basis, individual um, locations, whether that's commercial or in residential areas, and then discharge into the various um, streams and the, the river ultimately. Next slide, please. So we have three watersheds within the city of Newburgh. Um, those are shown by the shading there. Um, and again, they all ultimately end up in the Willamette River. So we are all bound by what's called the Willamette um, Basin uh, Total Maximum Daily Load. And we'll, we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Next slide, please. So one thing just to let everybody know is where streams really start. Um, and anymore, especially in an urban setting, they really start at, at the curb, um, at that catch basin. That catch basin basically drains directly into a creek. Um, sometimes it will go through a treatment, uh, some type of treatment facility, but in some cases, especially in older neighborhoods, it does not, it goes directly to the creek. So just remember, what, what goes into that there ends up in that creek. So don't wash your cars out there and don't pour your paint down those catch basins, et cetera. So um, just something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So um, again, issues, we have maintenance um, requirements. We have facilities and, and locations within town that have no um, stormwater facilities. And uh, so we're looking to try and um, fix that issue. We have Department of Environmental Quality Re Requirements. Those are the what we call the total maximum daily load. So those are um, pollutant loads that are set by the state about what can go into the different um, creeks and or river. So it's things like what's the temperature of the discharge, um, how much 
mercury might be in the water, how much phosphorus may be in the water. And we have certain regulations that have to be met for that discharge to um, go into to the river. So, and those requirements increase all the time. Um, in fact, there is just recently the mer mercury um, level or rule, what they call the mercury rule was just implemented this, this year. So we have 18 months to comply with that. Um, luckily, most of our requirements already meet those requirements. So we shouldn't have to add anything significant at this stage in the game, but it's something that we have to continually monitor. And then education, again, um, talking about, you know, where this, the creek really starts and it, letting people know that it does start at the curb and it does make a difference what we um, as residents do and put down um, into that catch basin or release out into the street. So we're continually working on that and trying to come up with additional information to let people know that you can make a difference. Next slide. So the transportation system. So it, it includes pavement, includes sidewalks and ADA ramps. Um, it includes bicycle facilities and transit. Excuse me, next slide, please. So here's our transportation system plan. Um, one thing to note is we have quite a few state highways um, within the city that we don't have a whole lot of control over. Um, that would be obviously 99W, um, which includes Hancock and First through downtown, the couplet. We have Highway 219, um, and which turns into College Street as you go further north. We also have Main Street and Highway 240. Those are all, um, and also actually now it's not shown on this map, but Springbrook Road right now from Highway 219 up to um, 99W is considered also a state highway. It's Highway 18. So some things to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So um, when we start talking about the transportation utility fee, that is directly related to um, fixing the pavement curb to curb. Um, and that was a policy decision that the council made um, in 2017, which was to try to maintain the current um, pavement, what's called the pavement condition index, which is basically a grade of the pavement. And at the time, our pavement uh, was rated about a 71. And the goal was within the next 10 years to keep it at 71, which means we needed to come up with a way to help um, maintain and fix the current pavement. So that's where the transportation utility fee came from. We're generating about 1.1, 1.2 million dollars a year. And <coughs> excuse me, every we've got a five-year plan, and we'll talk about that later on. And every year we go and do several projects. We do what we call maintenance, which would be the crack and slurry seal that you see. Um, and then we also are doing um, full depth replacement and fix of asphalt where we have to. So what you'll see on the, the one map there is the projects, um, the preservation projects for 2021. And then the other um, issue that has, is um, on the forefront is sidewalks. Both fixing um, sidewalks where they are cracked or broken or heaved and then installing sidewalks. Um, that is one of the um, requirements as we continue to move forward to allow for a multimodal system. And so you'll see um, a lot of projects fixing, trying to fix the sidewalks and address that. Again, I'll put another plug in. We do have a grant program out right now um, to help fix sidewalks. Sidewalks are, are the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. Um, but we do have $3,000 available for property owners to help fix their sidewalks. So I'll just plug that right now. Um, next slide, please. So again, <clears throat> the issues that we are um, facing in the transportation system is maintaining the pavement condition index, sidewalk gaps and filling those gaps, 
ADA facilities. Um, we are um, embarking on um, completing our um, ADA transition plan, which basically looks at um, all of the systems, not just the, the hard infrastructure, but um, all of our programs and looks at where we don't meet the requirements for ADA, um, where the gaps are and what we need to do to get there. Um, so that will become a bigger deal um, as we move forward. And then also bicycle facility gaps. Again, we have state law that requires us if we're building or rebuilding roads um, that we have to provide for bicycle facilities. So uh, next slide, please. And that's the, the end of the utility overview. Any questions? Yes, Karen, I have a question. Um, you know, when you're talking about sidewalks and it being the adjacent homeowner's responsibility to repair them. Mm -hmm. um, does the homeowner, is homeowner required to make those repairs, actually pay the city to make those repairs? They can't hire a contractor to do it on their own, can they? Yeah, they can. They can? Yeah, they, they would do that and they would pull, the contractor would pull a permit. Um, and uh, so, yeah. They but there's oversight by the city, right? We would inspect it. We would issue the permit and inspect the, the work to make sure okay. it's done standards. Okay. Do you have any kind of a, um, inspections? I live on the older side of the city mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have lots of sidewalk problems. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's any inspection that goes on because some of the areas are pretty bad because of you know older trees and root system interface and so on. And, so forth and it doesn't seem like there's any enforcement of that requirement. Yeah, we have not gone in, into a proactive um, enforcement mode. Um, we have talked about it at the, at the city council level. The council has not uh, so far been willing for us to go out and actively do that. Normally it's on a complaint basis. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we did again set up last year was a grant program so that we can help property owners because it, it's not easy and it's not cheap. Oh, um, yeah. to that. So um, to, 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 to try and help people want to do that. Um, and um, so we'll continue down that path. Um, the council may tell us at some point that we need to, to go out and actively enforce but they haven't done that yet. Yeah, because you take into consideration the liability concerns. I mean, you know, with the city's insurance policies and the like, because you yeah. know, if someone trips and falls over one of those, you got a poor person who's a homeowner. <laughs> yeah, it, and, and unfortunately it is their their homeowner's liability that, that would kick in in that yeah, regard. It would, but a lot of people, you know, if they, if they either own, well, some people don't have homeowners insurance or they don't have sufficient homeowners insurance to cover some kind of a catastrophic trip and fall accident, mm -hmm. which happens. And then the city's responsible for it. So, you know, you've got that secondary liability problem at least. So. Yeah, yeah it, like I said, it's, it's, it, it's a struggle. There, there is a requirement, um, but you know, people are, would not be happy if, if we just sent out letters to everybody within the city and said, by the way, you have 90 days, go fix your sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're trying to balance all of those pieces. Sure. But you do, you do, do you pass out? Cause I haven't seen any information, you know, as a homeowner about what my responsibilities are or what I could do to get some help from the city and fix it. Yeah. We're, my, yeah, I mean, we're actually fine, but my neighbors We're actively, actively right now sending out um, postcards to everybody in the city. Right. Um, we're doing it in pieces just because we have a limited number of staff that deal with it when it comes back in the door um, to give everybody um, information about that. But if you do go to our website and I can get you that link also, there's a whole page on sidewalks, who's responsible, um, the application forms and all of those types of things. Um, if you wanted to apply for a grant, um, we have grants available and loans available. So we have grants up to 6,000 or up to 3,000 
And then if it cost, would cost more, you know, depending what your um, issues are, we do have loan programs um, that we can go up to $6,000 for the loan. So, and make that available to, to property owners within the city. Okay. So, great. Mm -hmm. Oh, and one, I'm sorry, one last question. Are, are you folks responsible for signage too, you know, within that transportation thing? Yes, we are. Add more stop signs on the west, on the, the west side of town. Needs them badly. <laughs> that's, that's a whole different conversation. And uh -huh. uh, <laughs> that, I know that, I just... would, that would happen through the traffic safety commission, which is also runs through engineering. So. Anything else? So I will just jump in, um, Brenda, to kind of steer you on the next portion of this. This is usually where, you know, you would ask people if they had more um, questions or comments for the city staff. And then during each one of these meetings, there is a public comment section. And so this is when you would open public comment. Um, usually the city staff will know if somebody has registered for public comment. Um, so usually we would ask Zyra if there were any public comments and then wait a few um, beats to see if there were any of those. And then after you close your public comment on our um, agenda tonight is an adjournment. So this is where you will ask um, Zyra if there are any public comments um, before you close those and then adjourn the meeting. Okay. Anybody else have any questions of staff? <laughs> okay. Is there any, Zyra, is there any public comment? No, no public comment tonight. Okay. So that's it then? Okay. I move, but do I have to move to close the meeting? Nope. Okay, I guess our meeting's over then. <laughs> nice to meet all you folks. Yeah, you too. See you next okay. time. All right, see you next month. Take care. Or no, Every, later on this month, right? Two weeks. Later on this month, yeah. Yeah, all right, 27. Right. Okay, well, have a great rest of your evening. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.